Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcin Serdeczny. Uh, I'm a CFD engineer working at Flow Science. We are a company that develops uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics software. So I would like to talk to you about the uh, project we did together with Enlight, who is a uh, well, well-known uh, fiber laser produ producer. Uh, the title of the topic is Next Generation Melt Pool Control via Laser Beam Shaping and Laser Powder Bed Fusion. And I think this animation explains quite well what we will talk about. So we being a CFD software developer who does uh, computational fluid dynamic simulations, we're interested in simulating here um, the influence of the laser heat flux profile on the melt pool dynamics. So how is essentially uh, this energy that is transferred uh, into the melt pool affects the behavior of the molten material. To give a little bit of a structure to my presentation, I'll first start uh, talking about the motivation. Why do we and Enlight want to know um, the, the relation between laser intensity and the beam and the melt pool behavior. Uh, then I'll formalize the object and the scope of the work. And then I'll introduce to you the numerical model that we develop. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the validation, results of the simulations, and conclusions. Um, so laser intensity influences the melt pool behavior uh, by the way how we input the energy and that of course relates to the melting pattern and then the pressures and temperatures that develop during the process in the melt pool. And the fact that the melt pool itself is a key centerpiece of the laser powder bed fusion process you probably all well known and just by this pure fact it relates to many uh, features of the component that is produced such as porosity, micros microstructure or hardness, uh, surface roughness, and spatter. So there is no, um, it's, it's not really a brainer now why we want to know the relation between the heat flux intensity and the behavior of the melt pool. So in this particular project, we look at uh, a possibility of quantifying the uh, laser intensity profile uh, on the stability of the process, to be exact. So the scope of the process includes building a numerical model. In this case, we will simulate a single laser pass on a flat substrate made of and canal 718. Uh, then the model needs to be calibrated to the experiment and then with the calibrated model we can run simulations to uh, observe the influence and quantify the influence of the uh, beam shaping on the melt pool. So for those of you who don't typically use simulations and also computational flight dynamics, uh, CFD is a branch of fluid mechanics that focuses on solving uh, differential constitutive equations using numerical methods. And these are typically conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, which deliver information about the process temperature and velocity inside of the fluid in the process. And that, um, of course, can be coupled with many engin engineering, empirical, and analytical equations, which often are a, a great tool and powerful tool for many engineers. Uh, Flow 3D, we've been on the market for over 40 years and we've been developing CFD uh, simulations, CFD models uh, for um, for many industries and that includes water and environment casting but we also for uh, around 10 years been specializing in developing our specific product for additive manufacturing and that includes uh, not only laser powder, but fusion, but also directed energy deposition, material extrusion, binder jetting, um, and other processes. Um, so, to go more into the detail of this current project and any CFD simulations, we need to decide upon the geometry of the model. In this case, it was a flat plate, as I mentioned before, of a three millimeters uh, length. The um, the remaining dimensions are less important here as long as we set up a model in such a way that the boundaries are far enough from the melt pool so they don't actually influence the, the solution here. Uh, as in any numerical uh, model and a simulation software, we need to decide upon the grid uh, on which the, these uh, conservation equations will be solved. In this case, I have used uh, two mesh blocks. So one is in the vicinity of the melt pool itself, which has a, a cell size of five microns, and the outer mesh block which uh, essentially serves to simulate the heat diffusion uh, with a cell size of 20 microns. And that resulted with a mesh of around 4.5 uh, million cells, which for these simulations that I'm going to show you yielded a simulation time of around 10 hours on a 10-core on a machine. 
Um, since Flow3D AM is uh, a standalone package that allows to simulate different material, uh, different additive manufacturing processes, the user has a ability to, to activate different physical modules. So in case of laser powder bed fusion, we of course want to solve the heat, uh, the energy conservation equation. Um, in this case, we would like to predict the density dependency on the temperature, which allows to capture the buoyancy flows and the melt pool. Um, the molten material is of course a viscous material, so uh, capturing the viscosity dependency on the temperature is important. The solidification model takes care of um, um, predicting the behavior of the flow in the mashy zone, so whenever the uh, grain starts to form, there is additional drag on the flow field uh, from that process. Surface tension model predicts the pressure on the surface due to um, surface tension, and dependence on the surface tension coefficient on the temperature allows to predict the so-called Marangoni flows inside of the melt pool. Uh, the bubble and phase change model here is responsible for calculating the evaporation uh, mass loss and the cooling mass loss. Uh, sorry, the, the cooling effect uh, during the, due to evaporation. Um, and the recoil pressure model uh, predicts the amount of the force on the uh, molten metal free surface due to evaporation of the material. So as this ex as this gas expands, it um, it exerts the force on the material, uh, on the molten material, which drives the flow in the melt pool. Um, for, as a validation case, we use experiments that were run by our partner in this project, uh, who is Econi T3D. Uh, they have used N-light lasers, and uh, which has a possibility of setting three different heat flux or many more uh, heat flux distributions. But in this case, three uh, these indices were used, and that's index zero, which is um, close to a Gaussian shape, and then index three, which has more of the energy put to the outer ring, and the index six, which has uh, most of the energy actually concentrated at the outer ring and not really in the center of the beam. The total laser power was 700 watts, the laser scanning speed was 1.25 uh, meters per second, and the laser spot diameter was uh, 380 microns. That's, of course, the spot diameter after the optics. Um, so what you can see here are the cross-sections from the experiments uh, run by Aconity, uh, where you can see the melt pool uh, track dimensions cross-section, and these smaller squares inside are actually um, um, melt pools predicted by the simulation. So as you can see, as we move from index 0 to index 6 by shifting the amount of energy uh, to be applied further outside to the uh, to the rink, then the melt pool becomes shallower and wider. And that trend is actually captured by the simulation, which of course uh, you know, gives more confidence into the simulation and the model outcome. So now we move to the actual study where we would like to uh, investigate the influence of the beam shaping on the behavior in the melt pool. We will use again Inconel 718, but now we change the parameters slightly to the scanning speed of 2 meters per second, the laser power of 1.1 kilowatts, and the spot site rad radius to 120 microns. Uh, so now I will introduce the four beam shapes that were studied here. So first we start with our, let's say, reference case, which is the Gaussian ideal distribution with a width of 120 microns. That's again for a typical optics as it's used, as it's used in laser powder bed fusion. Um, with a magnification of around, let's say, five. Um, the flat top distribution. Uh, and now the, these two um, profiles that are available for the n uh, laser users, AFX1 index 5 and index 6, which essentially are a superposition of two, two Gaussian beams with shifted peaks, while index 6 has the central peak uh, much lower than index 5. And now these distributions, just to underline, they all were set in such a way that the spot size is the same for all of them. So the in, when the, whenever the intensity along the radius falls below the 13%, of the maximum peak, then that's how we define the spot size here, and this has, this has been fixed to all four uh, profiles. And they were all sca scaled up to in such a way so the total power uh, of the laser is 1.1 kilowatts. And now when we look at the results, so this is a view from the top uh, where we see, where you can see the, the heat flux distribution as a color variable, and you can see actually the turbulence that happens in the melt pool as the uh, laser moves. 
what we can see here is that the width of the track is essentially very similar to all four cases, and uh, the amount of turbulence that is observed is also uh, quite similar. When we look at the results more in a quantitative manner, we look at the average temperature, here it looks all very similar. With the average velocity, what we start seeing is that the Gaussian actually yields a lower velocity. Average maximum temperature also yields a very similar results, and the maximum velocity starts dropping for Gaussian. And this is actually where we scratch our head and thought this is not exactly what Econity and Enlight was observing in their, in their experiments. And we had to go back to look at our validation case that built our confidence in the model. Um, so in the previous case, we have parameters of 700 watts uh, for the validation that I showed to you, and the spot diameter of 400 microns and 1.25 uh, meter per second of the scanning speed, which yields an energy density of 1.4 kilojoule per meter, millimeter uh, square. While in the new conditions, we actually almost went to double the density of that. And that um, placed us in a regime where actually evaporation of the metal starts occurring more frequently, which uh, now uh, became a one additional parameter in the model, which was not the case during the validation. So. It is not necessarily a wrong solution, but we need to be aware now that this is um, uh, this is additional factor that needs to be calibrated. So uh, here is one more slide, a little bit about the recall pressure model that is implemented in Flow3D, and that's the equation that predicts this pressure on the free surface. It's uh, based on the clausius uh, clapeyron saturation temperature curve, and essentially it needs two coefficients, a and b, and b. Uh, can be estimated from material properties, while, while A is uh, alpha times the saturation pressure, so it's a sum ratio of the saturation pressure. This alpha typically is used to be 0 0.54 in many works, which is uh, based on the Anisimov work. Um, but now we needed actually to check whether this alpha setting was correct. So I used uh, experiments that were done in the Journal of Material Processing Technology by Lee et al, where uh, they have used the parameters as in the last column, where you can see that the energy density was actually much greater than what it was, both in the previous validation case and also in new conditions. But this energy density ensures that the evaporation happened in that process. So we can actually calibrate to those experiments the evaporation model. And here you can see the comparison of the uh, experimental results uh, with Lee et al. Then the, the red columns are the default, you could say, 0 0.54 coefficient, which is used in many, in many papers. And then alpha 0 0.1 is a tuning down of the recall pressure model, which gives a much better fit for, for 100 and 150 watts especially, which is much closer to what we're actually using here in this in this study. And then when we re-simulate these four cases, we can see that the actual um, the, the multiple behavior is much more smoother. Um, and when we start looking at the data in more quantitative ma manner, when we look at the average temperature inside of the melt pool, this are, again gives quite similar temperature because we have this uh, fixed spot size and fixed power, which gives us quite the same average power in the spot. When we look at the average velocity, we see uh, that the flat top starts leading now. Uh, the average maximum temperatures are quite similar, while the maximum temperature sh here shows a clear pattern that the Gaussian actually distribution has much higher maximum velocities uh, than index 6, which has most of the power in the outer ring. And here on this slide, you can also see um, the, the heat flux distribution together with the velocity vectors, both for these two extreme cases, so Gaussian and AFX1 index 6, which has most of the power in the outer ring. And, uh, and here, uh, what is used as the coloring variable is the evaporation pressure, which actually drives most of these velocity vectors. So because of having the centralized heat flux inside of the, of the, um, of the beam center, uh, this gives a lot of uh, velocity due to the recoil pressure, which is avoided in the index uh, 6, and actually translates to a st more stable melt pool with lower maximum velocities. And these maximum velocities, they uh, 
uh, they can be responsible for sputtering the process and actually ejecting the material outside of the melt pool. So to sum up, uh, above the certain energy uh, density threshold, the numerical result becomes sensitive to the uh, tuning of the regular pressure model. Um, so actually, whenever we are in the conduction mode, we can very often use the model without much tuning, which is very useful and also very convenient. But whenever we start actually uh, going towards this uh, higher dense energy densities, which is either the transition mode or a keyhole, we need the good experiments to tune the evaporation model. Which And then, of course, the calibration the model can be used for other experiments. And the way how we can probably recognize why we are, when we are in this regime is when the maximum temperatures uh, start exceeding the boiling temperature. With the calibrated model, we could show that the maximum velocities inside of the melt pool can be lowered by placing the energy outside of the, on the, of the beam center uh, by comparing the, here the Gaussian beam distribution to the uh, AFX1 index 6, which yielded a more stable melt pool in that matter. When comparing the, uh, the effect of different uh, intensity distributions, the definition of the spot size is very critical. I have run quite a few rounds before these studies where um, where this uh, spot definition wasn't fixed, and there the conclusions which you draw out from there uh, can be can be misleading. And I also have seen some papers where this is not well defined. For the high recoil pressure, uh, the influence of the intensity in intensity distribution. Um, may be lost due to turbulence inside of the model. So these, these first run of the simulations that I showed you with this um, Anisimov setting of alpha 0 0.54, where you could clearly see uh, the turbulent melt pool, um, this may happen at some point where you increase the intensity to such a high level that you actually start entering the keyholing regime. And there it might be that actually because of the so much of convection going on inside of the melt pool uh, and this turbulence, the, the fact where you actually place the energy loses so much meaning because all it mixes in the melt pool. While as long as we're in the, in the conduction mode and these recoil pressure are lower, um, these AFX1 uh, index 6 here l yields a lower maximum velocities which can be beneficial. As a future work, we're planning on now with having the calibrated model optimizing the laser intensity profile, so we could also run the optimization study in a more, more automatic way, uh, so just not to limit ourselves only to these two distributions. And uh, another factor is also to look how much the scanning speed here influences the process. So whether we actually hit the, some sweet spot here with the two meters per second, or what would be the influence from there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions here. <laughs>